Two weeks. So what is what is your your, your segment on, or the, the purpose of your interview? I don't know much about it. It's. I'm going to start by asking you about your sort of economic philosophy. Uh, and how it pertains to, I guess, the world and Australians, and then take it, take it from there, guys. Do I have time just to duck to the bathroom? Is that okay? Excuse me. I'm just going to duck to the bathroom at my end. Are you guys ready to roll? I'm just going to be two sex. Go ahead. Yeah. How, how far are you away, Dad? Yeah. I'm just going to fix my hair, etc. Yeah. Okay, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. You've picked the global economy crashing once before. What do you see happening now? Well, you know, I, I think the, the main problem is going to be with the United States and the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. I think this period of history is coming to an end. I think the world agreeing to accept the dollar and hold it as the reserve is one of the main reasons that we have the global economic imbalances that we do. And I think uh, it really amounted to a gigantic subsidy that was bestowed on the United States by the rest of the world. Uh, the cost of that subsidy really undermined economic growth outside the United States, but facilitated a bubble within the United States. And I think that bubble has popped. And there's a lot of air that's going to come out. And I think it, it really means a major realignment of exchange rates and, and living standards that ultimately is a very positive development for the global economy. And in the long run, even for the U.S. economy, to the extent that we actually do the right thing. What's the solution for policymakers? Well, look, policymakers around the world have to resist the politically popular temptation to do something. The best thing that policymakers can do is do nothing, or better yet, undo some of the damage that they've already done. Meaning anytime government interferes in the free market, they're doing damage. And government interference is a burden, right, that, that, that the economy has to bear. And when the economies are strong, it's easier to bear that burden. But whenever there's uh, economic problems, the burden becomes much heavier and, and, and much higher, harder to bear. So governments should really be shrinking uh, their size. Unfortunately, governments around the world, for political reasons, are doing the opposite. They're spending more money instead of spending less money. Because any money the government spends is money it needs to withdraw uh, from the private sector. And the private sector would be much more efficient in the way it invests money or spends money than the government. Uh, people think that government is free as long as their taxes aren't going up. But whenever the government is spending, uh, the society has to bear the cost in one way or another. And it, you know that's what's happening. And of course, governments could also look at a lot of the regulations that are on the books and try to repeal as many as possible so that businesses can focus their resources more productively and not have the distraction of having to divert some of those resources to complying with regulations that really don't do anything to improve the economy. In many cases, they were put there uh, because there was a political interest uh, that wanted them there because it favored one group while punishing another. And the best thing is for the government to stay neutral and not to try to use its power uh, to tilt the playing field in favor of certain special interests at the expense of others. We've seen an unprecedented increase in the role of the state in Australia thanks to COVID, both with subsidies trying to kickstart our or grow our economy, given the pressures, and also in terms of the state telling people how to live their lives. There seems to be a pushback from the ordinary people, population in respect of this increased role of the state. Do you see that as a phenomenon, a phenomenon around the world where people are pushing back against, I guess, the increased role of, of, of the state in terms of regulation, subsidies? Look, look, they should be pu pushing back. I mean, first of all, I think that the health threat of COVID-19 has been exaggerated. Uh, but whatever that threat is, the country needs to deal with it without the government adding to the problem
by spending more money and borrowing more money and making itself bigger. This is just adding a fiscal problem, a monetary problem, onto a health problem. So to the extent that the economy is going to suffer in the short run because it has to deal with this virus, well, then that has to happen. Because anything the government does now in the name of alleviating the suffering just guarantees that there's going to be a lot more suffering in the long run. And, you know, and I also think that a lot of people, when they are trying to figure out a policy response, they are not doing the proper cost-benefit analysis of the response because they feel that the government can somehow absorb all the costs, that nobody has to lose any money so long as the government replaces everybody's lost income. So if we start from the premise that the government can't do that because the government doesn't have any money that it doesn't first remove from the private sector so that any response to COVID-19, we have to deal with the consequences. We have to deal with the lost economic activity and the lost income, and there's nothing the government can do to make it up. Then I think we're going to have a better cost-benefit analysis and come up with a more viable uh, response to COVID-19 rather than the reckless response that we have now because everybody assumes there's no cost because they believe that the central banks or the government can replace all the lost income when people are no longer engaged in productive activity. Do you think pe to people are too willing to pay their taxes without asking, is it fair? Should they pay taxes? Well, I mean, personally, to the extent that we have taxes, Taxes should be to fund uh, general government purposes. Excuse me, wait for that. Yeah, I'm gonna, my phone is ringing. Maybe just pop that off the hook. <clears throat> just ask me that question again after Hello? someone gets the phone. All right. Are people too willing to pay taxes without questioning if those taxes are fair or reasonable? Well, I mean, first of all, I think legitimate taxation is for the, the, the general uh, benefit of the nation as a whole, not for the specific benefit of any one individual or group of individuals. So I think it's morally wrong, and in the United States, it's legally wrong for the government to take money from one person and then give it to somebody else. But to the extent that you know, money is being used, let's say, for national defense, something that benefits everybody, then I think it's a legitimate function of government uh, to impose a tax uh, to pay for the general defense of the nation. But, you know, what a lot of politicians are doing is they're using taxing to basically rob from some people and then give the money to other people in exchange for their votes. And so it really amounts to a legalized theft. And I don't care how you want to dress up theft. You know, just because the government does it doesn't change the nature of what's going on. It's still theft. You're still taking property uh, from other people against their will. You're taking money from people uh, who earned it and giving it to people who don't. I mean, it's one thing for somebody to voluntarily help out their fellow man by donating of their own free will uh, their own property, but it's another thing to steal it from them. And it doesn't change the nature of that relationship when you vote for the thief, and then the thief uh, steals for you. Uh, but, you know, the other type of taxation that people don't seem to get is inflation. I mean, inflation is really a tax, right? It's an expansion of the money supply. But when government creates money and spends it, instead of collecting that money in taxation, the public still bears the cost. Because under legitimate taxation, the government takes your money and gives it to somebody else. But when they create inflation to, to finance their spending, they're taking your purchasing power and giving it to somebody else. Because when somebody else gets that newly created money, but they didn't produce any goods or services and add that value into the economy, they just got money and now they can buy stuff, they're just bidding up prices. And so now the people that already had money can buy less stuff because the cost of stuff goes up because you have more money bidding for it. So that loss of purchasing power amounts to a tax. And, and, and I think the inflation tax is going to get higher and higher, and that's what people really need to object to. Peter, why did you start your own bank in Puerto Rico? 
Well, I initially started it outside of Puerto Rico and eventually moved it there because I moved to Puerto Rico myself. Um, and there were significant tax advantages of my bank being in Puerto Rico. And there are some other uh, advantages. You know, people, there was a stigma about banks in the Caribbean. And I didn't think we would have that stigma it being in Puerto Rico, considering that it's part of the United States. So I thought it would give the bank you know, a better image with the regulators. Uh, and of course, you know, it was more advantageous personally for me tax wise and the fact that I had moved to Puerto Rico myself. But the original reason that we set this bank up uh, was I did want to have a facility uh, for uh, people who follow me to invest with me without having to go through uh, the U.S. firm. I thought it would be easier uh, to have foreigners investing through my offshore bank. Uh, but, you know, now I've kind of given that up. I mean, I'm taking foreign accounts now through my asset management company in, in Puerto Rico, Europe Pacific Asset Management. So I'm doing a lot more asset management there than through the bank. The kind of bank has really evolved more into a business bank for offshore uh, companies that have a lot of transactions, that do a lot of foreign exchange. Uh, we offer very competitive rates. And we also don't make loans. You know, my bank uh, is a 100% reserve bank. And so right now you have a lot of these banks that have very, very risky loan portfolios. Nobody gets any interest on a bank deposit anyway. So, you know, why take the risk when there's no reward? So my bank doesn't loan out the deposits. Uh, so at least my customers, are, you know, can rest uh, comfortably knowing that, you know, my bank's not going to fail because I'm not making any loans that can go bad. I'm just, you know, holding the deposits and I'm facilitating uh, their transactions. So, uh, and we've got clients around the world, again, mostly in small businesses who, you know, deal with a lot of payments and they want to be able to make them efficiently and they don't want to worry about the bank failing, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, between between payments. How many Australians are using your bank? Um, I don't know. I don't know the exact uh, number. Why, why, do you think, why do you think Australians are using your bank? Is it because they're concerned about banking in Australia? No, I mean, I think in general, the reason that people are using an offshore bank is they generally have an offshore business and they're dealing in multiple jurisdictions and multiple currencies. And it's just a much more efficient way to operate. I mean, I find that a lot of the domestic banks, uh, the cost to do these transactions are very high. Uh, and, and so I think I just offer a more efficient model as far as the cost structure uh, to, to facilitate these transactions. So I think it's, again, yeah, it's mostly people operating businesses. It's not, you know, a lot of uh, just savings accounts. I mean, although there can be some people uh, that are worried about banks failing, about banks that, you know, could go out of business, about bail-ins. I mean, there are some government insurance schemes, uh, but you don't have that concern with my bank. And, you know, we also do give people the ability to hold uh, gold or silver as an alternative to any fiat currency. So there's not a lot of banks that necessarily do that. I mean, we will, we will allow our customers to dominate deposits in gold or silver. In fact, I'm working on a program that will really make it easier for my customers to transact in gold and silver, uh, to use gold and silver, you know, as a medium of exchange. You know, I, my, my banking program uh, recognizes gold as a currency. So it treats it the way it treats the euro or the yen or the pound or the Aussie dollar. And so it really makes it a lot easier for people to, you know, have debit cards linked to gold, uh, to, you know, do electronic checks on a gold deposit. And I think more and more people are going to be worried about the inflation tax, uh, not just worried about the bank failing, but worry about the value of their currency failing, uh, the deposits losing value to inflation. Uh, and so people, I think, want the ability to be able to choose which fiat currency they want to hold their savings in or you know, to hold real money, gold, and, and, and no fiat currencies. Tell me about your relationship with the Perth Mint in Australia. Yeah, I've had a relationship with Perth Mint for a long time. You know, I started with the Perth Mint program, I think back in like 2002. I became a dealer at my brokerage firm, Euro Pacific Capital, and we started Perth. I really liked the program that they had there. 
I thought it was a good alternative to, let's say, an ETF where people are worried about, you know, maybe the gold's not really there. It seemed like it was a good program. It was backed up by a government of, you know, in Australia. It was reinsured through Lloyd's. Uh, so it seemed like a, a safe depository. There were no storage fees for gold uh, at the time. When I, in fact, there were no storage fees for silver when I first started. If it was unallocated, they later ended up adding some storage fees. Uh, but I thought it was a great program. We ended up with a lot of our clients' money uh, at the Perth Mint. And then when I opened up Euro Pacific Bank, uh, we just uh, established a relationship there as well so that uh, bank customers could also uh, use the Perth Mint as a, as a secure uh, depository for their bullion. So just take me through that. Why should Australians using your bank in Puerto Rico be assured of the security of their money because of the link to the Perth Mint? Well, I mean, the security of their bank deposit or the security of their gold? So w why is it attractive for Australians to use your bank knowing that the Perth Mint's involved? What's, what's, the, uh, what's the attraction? Well, I mean, I think if they want to buy gold, one of the initial attractions was the fact that we had a debit card that was linked to gold so that somebody can go and take a debit card and they could use it and then they're, you know, and they would be able to spend their gold. So their purchasing power would be in gold while they're waiting to utilize it rather than a fiat currency uh, that would depreciate in value. But it's more of a convenience. I mean, once you have a bank account with me, you can do a number of things. You can open up a brokerage account linked to that uh, bank account. You can buy bullion. You can deal in foreign exchange. There are a lot of things. So once you had an account, uh, it was, I guess it's a convenient way. But I'm sure a lot of my customers who uh, have gold through my bank have gold uh, in other jurisdictions or other locations. I mean, I you know, recommend that people diversify uh, their gold storage. You know, don't leave, put all your eggs in one basket. I mean, people should have gold uh, you know, at home and they should have gold in, in various uh, depositories uh, just for political risk, you know, diversify it. I should ask you, do you actually have Australian customers with your, with your bank? Yeah, I said we do. I don't know exactly how many customers we have. We have customers in well over 100 different uh, countries. So, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a global uh, bank. And so there are people, people from around the world. And just take me through, how does an Australian start up an offshore bank account? I, you know, I don't know. You're asking me a lot of questions about the bank. I am not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the bank. I am a shareholder of the bank, and that's my entire role. I don't manage it. Uh, you know, I, I don't run the operations. But I would suggest if you're interested in the bank, you can look at the website. And uh, there are instructions on our website on how to go about opening up an account. You know, these days, it's not easy to open up a bank account. There's a lot of paperwork that you need to go through to open up an account. There's a lot of compliance. Uh, AML, know your customers. Uh, more people who apply for accounts at our bank uh, are turned down than are approved. So it's, it's not easy to get an account at our bank. You really have to go through uh, the ringer uh, before you're actually allowed to open one. But I would suggest that if you're interested, just you know, try to open one. We don't take Americans, but we do take Australians. Why not Americans? Excuse me? Why, why not Americans? Well, and you know, we're probably going to start taking Americans at some point. But when I initially started, I, I really wanted to keep my American customers in the U.S. And I, I didn't want to route them uh, to the offshore bank. And there was a lot more regulations there. Uh, so it just seemed a lot easier to split the business, uh, the domestic customers in the U.S. and international customers. But now we're, you know, as I said, I'm taking a lot more instant international customers at my asset management company. We have more now that we're taking at the bank. And we do want to open it up to Americans, but there's more things that we have to do uh, to make that, uh, make that happen. But uh, it, it will happen eventually. Peter, to prepare for this interview, I have spoken to some uh, investigators around the world. They say your bank's facilitating organised crime and corruption, <laughs> money laundering, tax evasion. Is that, is that true? Well, first of all, you know, I, I don't really like the direction of the interview because nobody told me that you were going to talk to me about the bank. You know, and so that really wasn't what um, the interview was supposed to be about because I know that 
you know, had that been the case, I may I might not have agreed to even do the interview. Um, well, why why not? Is your bank involved? No, but in facilitating. Uh, but the, look, the bank is not looking for publicity. There have been some allegations. All of the allegations are unfounded, and there's no basis in fact for any of them. Um, but since there there is an investigation, it's not really something that I want to talk about or or call attention to. Um, you know, nothing has actually been found. I mean, we've complied with all sorts of requests for information, but nobody has actually found that my bank has done anything wrong. And uh, I seriously doubt that they will. As I said, it's very difficult to open an account at my bank. Um, and we probably turned down a lot of honest people uh, because the, the, the process is so difficult. Um, and I think we, we go above and beyond. We probably do a lot more than your typical bank to make sure uh, that ev everybody that's opening up an account is doing so for legitimate, lawful purposes. And we have done nothing to facilitate, uh, you know, the, the opposite. There's an organized crime figure in Australia called Simon Antiquel who was using your bank. Again, How could such a notorious crime figure Look, be allowed to get look, through the front asking, door of your bank. You're asking me questions that I cannot answer because I do not work at the bank. I'm not a compliance officer. I, you know, I have nothing to do with the daily operations of the bank. But I can tell you that it is very difficult. As I said, try to open up an account with a bank. You know, try to pose uh, as a suspicious character. There's no way you're going to get through compliance. So to the extent that somebody got through compliance, they were pretty squeaky clean. I'm sure that they have accounts at other banks uh, in addition to mine. If they pass through our, our, our KYC, uh, that means they were pretty good. And, uh, you know, that, does that mean you can catch everybody? You know, from what I understand, too, everybody that people are interested in is uh, accused of potentially evading taxes. And, you know, not laundering money, not drug dealing, not terrorists. Um, and so that's kind of the hardest thing for a bank to know. Even though you put somebody through all of the, you know, the compliance, it's impossible to know if every customer is compliant with their local tax laws. I mean, nobody would know that. Uh, you know, you try your best to figure it out, but it's not, you know, it's not possible to catch everybody. If people are using your bank to evade taxes, would that be a, a bad thing in your mind? Well, you know, that's not why the bank is there, you know, and, um, you know, but, you know, there are, 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 are there some people who may have accounts that aren't compliant? I'm sure. But I, I would imagine that the ratio at our bank is probably lower than at typical banks, including onshore banks. I mean, every major bank you know, some of their customers are not compliant with their taxes, right? So, you know, you can't hold my bank to an impo a standard that's impossible to meet, but we certainly don't market to people who are, you know, trying to evade taxes. That's not anything that's on our website. That's nothing that we do. We don't go out of our way to facilitate it. In fact, we do everything that we can to prevent it from happening. But again, you know, I really don't, think that because I didn't I didn't agree to the interview because I know the bank doesn't want to you know draw attention to these false allegations and 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 so you know I didn't want to do an interview about about a bank you know I thought you wanted to talk to me about the economy about stuff like that not about what's happening uh, at at the Euro Pacific Bank you say your marketing attracts only law-abiding people but the marketing for the bank, some of those pushing it uh, say to clients, you can connect with the bank via military-grade encrypted communications. It'll be total, total secrecy. It's in, Port it's in Puerto Rico. Aren't they all things no, that no, no. tax there's nothing, a criminal would want? There's nothing about our bank that talks about secrecy or privacy or anything like that. The only thing that we stress is that we are a 100% reserve bank, that we don't make loans, and that we have competitive rates, right? Our, we have, we the offer a wide variety of services and school. our rates are competitive. The there's home. nothing, there's the nothing home. on our website uh, that suggests that you have any type of extra privacy or extra secrecy 
as a result of having a bank account with us. You, it's, you have, you're subject to all the same rules and regulations and the, you know, governments could, you know, you're, you're not any more private uh, than any other bank that you could choose. But Peter, those marketing your bank, your referral agents, they consistently say the reason to use your bank is because of its great secrecy who, and low or no, who says or low that? Or no tax. Pa Patrick Flynn, there a is no in secrecy. Queensland. There's no, there's no banking secrecy in Puerto Rico. I don't even understand. Puerto Rico is not even a tax haven. I mean, it is for me, but not for uh, banks. You know, it's, there, there's no secrecy there at all. There's no, there's no special privacy. It's, you know. The, the whole point of someone in Australia setting up an account in Puerto Rico is to avoid or minimize their tax, is it not? No. I, look, What's the people reason? could be, so you're saying, you're saying to me that the only reason that anybody would use an offshore bank is to evade taxes. You don't think there's any legitimate purposes that all these banks uh, satisfy all around the world? Well, I'm asking, you're, you're the expert. Isn't that a reason why many people no, use look, these banks people, to avoid paying you, taxes? You, you, can, you, you don't have to have an offshore bank uh, to, uh, to not pay your taxes. But first of all, too, I mean, people, Australia, Australians are not even taxed on their worldwide income like Americans are. So if an Australian operates a business in South America and that business generates a profit, Australia is not taxing them on that profit. Uh, so they don't even the have problem, to evade the tax. They don't owe it. What, what, what we've been told is Australians are hiding their profits they're making in Australia by setting up offshore structures and then using your bank to hide their profits, sometimes their dirty profits. Well, look, I seriously doubt that. There's been no evidence. But to, look, again, no, no safe is perfect. Can somebody crack it? So if they if they certainly find that somebody, you know, evaded taxes and put the money in my bank, it's not because we helped them. It's simply because we weren't able to ferret it out. But as I said, you're going to find the same situation uh, with other banks. I mean, how many how many people in Australia do you think are not compliant with their taxes? I mean, how, what, what's the number? Probably quite a few, but I imagine yeah, many of those. And I, I would bet if any of them are using my bank, it is a tiny fraction, <laughs> a tiny, you know, if any. And so, you know, and, you know, and, and it's not my bank's uh, uh, a mission to administer the tax laws of Australia, right? I mean, Australia what, what needs to enforce its laws. And if Australia believes that there's somebody using my bank, they have proper channels where they can go through the regulators in the United States and get information on depositors. I mean, there are channels to do this. If they think, here's an Australian at, at, at this bank, they can get the information. All they have to do is go through proper channels and they'll get it. As I said, you know, there is no extra secrecy uh, that people enjoy by having a deposit at my bank than they would have uh, and any other bank, including a bank in Australia. So Australian tax authorities do think that your bank is facilitating tax evasion and Excuse organised me? crime. But, well, what happened, what happened on January 24 this year? I don't know what you're referring to. Well, didn't the IRS pay you a visit? Look, as I said, I don't want to discuss all of these uh, questions about the bank or what may or may not have happened. I'm just going to give you a final answer on the bank, and I'm going to say that there is no problem at my bank. There is no proof uh, that the bank is being used to facilitate any illegal activity. Uh, the bank was not set up for that purpose, uh, and nor has it been operating for that purpose. And you know, whatever these allegations are, my anticipation is that nothing will come of any of them, and all of the allegations will be withdrawn and any regulators will find that any concerns that they had about my bank were misplaced. How, how is it that organized crime investigators, tax investigators in the Netherlands, I, I, I the said, United let's States, let's talk about the something United, else. United I don't Kingdom, want to keep talking about Canada, my bank. I've told and you Australia that the bank that your banks is not involved in any of these activities. But is it not a, it's, it's a fair thing to ask. Authorities in the no, Netherlands... It's not a fair thing to ask. I've, or, I've already spoke longer on this topic 
than I intended, because at no point did you ever tell me that the purpose of this interview was to discuss Euro Pacific Bank. Because as I said, I am not really well positioned to discuss a bank that I don't work for. I am a shareholder of the bank. I am a passive owner of the bank, so I am not involved in it daily operations. But the bank trades and, on and your so name. The bank it's, uses you. It's not you. A, bank... a topic that I really want to discuss. I appreciate that. The bank uses you as its key piece of marketing, though. So therefore, you have a responsibility, don't you? When the if the bank goes south, well, I've already it's told on you. you. I've already told you that there is that the allegations that you are uh, referring to are false. There, none of them have been proven, and none of them will be proven because there's no evidence to support anything. Look, anybody can allege something. But it's another thing to actually have facts that prove it. Well, let, and let me, just because let me tell just you. because somebody somebody may have evaded their taxes and they may or may not have had an account at my bank, it doesn't mean that my bank did anything wrong uh, in the process of opening up that account. So let, let me tell you a fact. The Kinaham Crime Syndicate of Ireland, one of the biggest multinational drug syndicates in the world, has used your bank to facilitate. How do, how do you know they've used my bank? My, it's my job. I'm a journalist. I've, I've, I've researched but what, that. Yeah, but you may, but shouldn't, you, shouldn't you may you, be wrong. Shouldn't you know that? You may be wrong. Shouldn't you know that? How have they used your, have, has the Kinahan what? Crime Syndicate used your bank? Okay, so are you telling me as a journalist right now that you know for a fact that this crime syndicate is utilizing my bank? I'm asking you that question. Is the crime no, syndicate no, utilizing I just, your bank? I asked I've the never heard here. of that. I've never heard of that syndicate. I am asking you. You're telling me that they are. are. Are you saying for a fact that they are? Well, my research tells me they are, and I'm asking you why is that? All right, but I'm, I just want to know because I want to know if I have a basis for a lawsuit against uh, against your, uh, your your paper or you know your whatever your network that you're working for. Are you making that allegation right now? I'm are you officially saying that my that my bank is? Uh, Ha has accounts for these individuals. I'm putting to you that your Be bank has accounts for organized crime figures. That's right. Now, I I'm telling you that I don't, that we don't. But if you want to tell me right now that we do, that's fine. Because now, if that's not true, because I can look at the records and find out, then I have the basis of a lawsuit against you. So are you, in fact, telling me right now that you know for a fact that this crime syndicate is utilizing your Pacific Bank? Peter, shouldn't you be more concerned if organized crime... No, no, no. I want you to answer that question. You're, you're saying it. Is it just a mere allegation? Are you, are you speculating or do you know? Shouldn't the question be for you... No, no. You answer my question. No, I'm, I'm the journalist here. I'm, I'm asking the questions here, sir. No, no. Simon... But I, I choose what I answer, but you, you can't just make an allegation against me. I've already told you I've never heard of that crime syndicate and I seriously doubt that anybody operating it has an account at my bank. Well, now, if you, well, if Peter, you believe why, otherwise, then you tell me. Well, Peter, why is it the tax authorities in Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, America, and the Netherlands all believe your bank is facilitating tax evasion and serious organized crime? Well, I don't know. Have you asked them? Because we're not. I'm asking you. You run the bank. It's your bank. No, no. You ask them. We're not facilitating tax evasion or organized crime or anything like it. What, what did they but, you know, if, if if they think it's happening, I mean, it's got nothing to do with reality. There's a lot of things that a government could believe that might not be true. You shouldn't be asking me, why don't you ask those governments why they believe it? I can assure you I, I will. What did you tell the IRS when they came to you this year? I told you I'm not talking to you about my personal, uh, you know, interactions that may or may not have happened with the IRS, all I can tell you is there is no tax evasion going on at the bank. The bank is not facilitating anything and nothing has happened to the bank, right? My bank is operating business as usual where nobody has tried to, you know, impede our activity. Nobody has said we've done anything wrong. Do you, do you appreciate that there is a chance that criminals may be attracted to your bank because of the low taxes and the secrecy the bank referrers There is promote. no secrecy. Well, certainly- I told you that. There, there well, is no secrecy the, at our bank. The mere fact that it's in Puerto Rico, away from the- No, it does, the, so, no Puerto Rico isn't away from anything. So Puerto what, Rico is part of the United States. It is a US possession. US laws apply in Puerto Rico. It, it, 
it, it, it, there's no more secrecy in Puerto Rico than in any of the 50 states. Well, that, that's not quite true, it's is it? It's the same law. Well, it, it's, isn't it correct that, the, that Puerto Rico does not, is not part of the multilateral competent authority agreement, therefore does not share information about potential tax evasion, etc., with global authorities? Isn't that the reason you're in Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico is, Puerto Rico is in the same situation as every bank in every American state. So those, what you're saying applying to Puerto Rico is the same for banks in the states, every state. So we're complying with the banking laws of the United States. Now, you have a problem with the banking laws of the United States. Well, that's fine. But we are complying with those laws. I appreciate that. The reason you moved to Puerto Rico was because, as you say, other, other states in the U.S., are compliant with this multilateral agreement. No. Is, the, is that the, the reason I told you why? I already told you why I moved to Puerto Rico. I had nothing to do with those banking laws. It had to do with the, my personal tax situation because if I have a company in Puerto Rico, my income is taxed more favorably than if my company operates outside of Puerto Rico. And also, we were told that Puerto Rico was a better jurisdiction that it would be easier for us to get a direct relationship with the Federal Reserve, which we have since obtained, and it would be easier for us to become direct issuers of MasterCard or Visa or American Express if our bank was in Puerto Rico versus in a, a Caribbean island that was, you know, traditionally considered, you know, a tax haven. So we moved to Puerto Rico to be in a jurisdiction that was actually more compliant and had a better reputation around the world uh, so that we would be able to offer uh, the services that we wanted. So, uh, and in fact, there, were a there was a bank secrecy law. When we started out, we were in St. Vincent's and they did have bank secrecy as part of their banking laws. We gave all that up. When we moved to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico has no bank secrecy. But the big difference between the two jurisdictions, is it not, is that Puerto Rico is not part of the MCAA, therefore it doesn't share information well, with countries like Australia? Well, that, that, but, but that, that difference had nothing to do with our decision to move. But wh why, uh, it's why because are you Puerto referral? Rico, Puerto Rico is an American bank. So Puerto Rico complies with all the rules for American banks. That, that, that's why that's like that. We have no control over that. So have you then handed over the details sought by Australian, US, et cetera, authorities about your customer base to the tax authorities who targeted you and your bank this year? Have you As handed- I said, look, I, I, I am not involved with the day-to-day -day operation of the bank. I don't, I'm just gonna get out of this chair if you're gonna keep asking me these kind of questions. I've already answered the question that we're not involved in any illegal activity. The bank was not set up uh, to facilitate illegal activity. We do everything we can to make sure it doesn't happen, including turning down far more accounts than we approve because our compliance is so rigorous. And in fact, if you think we're doing something wrong, why don't you try to open up an account at our bank? Go there under an assumed name and give us some BS and see if you can actually open up an account. I dare you. Well, Peter, we've tried to do that. Have you, have you tried to open up an account at our bank? Ye yes, we have. So we've gone to one of your- Oh, you have? We've gone to one of your referrers, your bank referrers. And he has promote. this bank referrer promotes your bank because of the low taxes and secrecy. Well, if they're, first of all, we don't, none of the, none of the people who refer business to our bank are, work for us, right? We don't have any control over people who refer their clients to our bank. But if there is a referral agent who is telling people that they get some extra secrecy at our bank, they're wrong because they don't get it. We don't market that, we don't advertise that, and we don't provide that. But you know, can I be responsible for what an independent affiliate, or not even affiliate, somebody who's referring me a bus you know, business, I don't know what they're necessarily saying to their own customers. But I seriously doubt uh, that they're saying that because it's just not true. And so, you know, if, if people think they're going to get secrecy at my bank, you know, they're not because we don't have it. Isn't it fair enough? You, you say I'm not involved in the day to day operations of the bank, yet your name is affixed to the bank. The bank markets itself on the back of your reputation. My, my name is not on the bank. It's not it's Euro Pacific Bank. It's not Peter Schiff Bank. But everyone knows it's Peter Schiff's bank, don't they? 
Well, not everybody. In fact, as I told you initially, the bank initially was started so that I could have my investment clients investing money and me managing their money through the bank. A long time ago, we kind of stopped that. And so most of the customers at the bank don't even know who I am. You know, they're not necessarily Peter Schiff fans who have read my book and who are following my investment strategy. The clientele of the bank is more traditional banking business from individuals that are operating multinational companies, you know, and there is a legitimate uh, market and niche uh, for offshore banks, you know, and we serve a, 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 a purpose and we provide a valuable service. It has nothing to do uh, with people trying to, you know, not pay their taxes. What, what do you think of the Panama Papers? Was that a bait up in your mind? Look, I'm not, none, none of that involved me or my bank. Haven't, hasn't your, your business used Mossack Fonseca? It's named in the Panama well, Papers. So, like I, as I said, I'm, I, I'm, I, why don't you ask me some other questions about the economy, about you know, anything that I normally talk about, but if the only thing you want to do is talk about your Pacific Bank, then I just really don't have anything else to talk about, and I think we should just end the interview. Peter, if you've got nothing to hide, you can answer these questions. Why have your businesses? No, no, no. I don't. Why I, have your businesses? You should have used approached Mossack me Fonseca? in the beginning, and I do have nothing to hide. But that doesn't mean that I need to call, you know, additional attention to this uh, investigation. But well, respectfully, you know, the you're, investigation you're at the will center speak of the for biggest itself. Tax investigation when, in when, the world. When the regulators find nothing, right? Whatever their whatever their suspicions are, when they are not confirmed by the actual records of the bank, then all the investigations will close. And so why don't we just allow the process to work out? Do you at least acknowledge, Peter, you are, can you at least acknowledge your bank is at the center of the biggest tax evasion investigation no, I, in the I, world I, I do, today? Are you, are you making an allegation against my bank? It's not me, it's making the allegation, the authorities are. No, no, you, you know that then well. stop it. If you want to make an allegation against my bank, then you stand by it, and then and then we'll see if there's any legal repercussions. I'm not making the allegation, as you well know. The tax well, authorities. Well, it sounds like you are to me. Well, the tax authorities are making the allegation. They raided no, no, your no. bank. They're targeting you. You're your making bank. an allegation. Nobody. No, no, nobody has told us that we've done anything wrong. Nobody. Well, you do know the IRS visited you this year. Surely that would be. Look, look, it does. People can be investigated for all sorts of reasons. Doesn't mean they did anything wrong. Maybe they just wanted some records because they thought somebody else did something wrong and they thought maybe we had records that would help in that investigation. But I'm going to tell you that nobody from any regulatory body has found that we have done anything wrong. And, you know, and we're certainly not operating this bank for the purpose of facilitating tax evasion. You know, I'll let you in on a little secret. You know, I started this bank about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, and I've yet to take any distributions, right? So personally, I haven't actually made any money from my ownership of this bank since the day I started it, yet I put millions of dollars in capital to set the bank up. So I'm certainly not facilitating tax evasion for nothing. <laughs> why, why would I operate the business and not make a nickel? I mean, and one of the reasons that I haven't made any money yet at the bank is because so much of my revenue is tied up in compliance. I have to spend so much money to make sure that nobody is, you know, laundering money through my bank that that's what I spend most of my money on. Most of my money goes to compliance and I'm spending all this money on compliance. And so there's nothing left over for me. Now, eventually I'm hoping that the bank will be profitable, uh, but so far it hasn't been. And to say that, oh, I'm facilitating tax evasion, why? I mean, I haven't benefited one nickel. What would be the reason that I would want to encourage uh, people to, uh, you know, commit crimes uh, and take all kinds of risk personally that I might be punished to make no money? So why do you think these tax authorities are targeting you? Is it because of your celebrity status? <laughs> They're not really tar- Ask them. Ask them. Don't ask me. I'm asking you. They've come to your door. I... Why do you think? I already told you. Why do we you... did nothing wrong. But you, so you say you've done nothing wrong. The bank's done nothing wrong. Yes. Why are they targeting and no, the bank? Is it I'm a, telling it's a big you we've mistake? done nothing wrong. And no regulators have told us that we've done anything wrong. And I don't think you should keep 
insinuating that I have. Peter, what if I told you that a Russian organised crime figure, a cyber criminal behind one of the biggest organised criminal cyber scams in the world, banks with your bank? Again, are you telling me for a fact that this individual does bank with my bank? Yes. Is that what you're saying? I'm telling you these organised crime figures bank with your bank. What, and give me a name. Simon Antiquo of Australia. Who? Simon Antiquo. Who? His name is Simon, Simon Adigrel? Antiquo. He's an organised crime figure. I don't He's know, but jail. you know what? Have He's your guys send me, send me the name and I will send it to my bank and I will see if this individual has, has an account or any entity that he is uh, involved in. And if not, then maybe you'll hear from our lawyers. But if your compliance is so good, how because if you're if you're going to publicly state right now that this person has an account with my bank and they don't, well, I think I think uh, that's actionable. What, you're asking me about who has accounts with your no, bank. No, you're, you're the one that's that? insinuating this. If you're telling me great, that organized you... cr criminals have accounts at my bank, I don't think you have any proof of that. Well, I'm putting to you what law enforcement and tax authorities around the world think, as you well know. Yeah, well, well, they're not telling us. They're not having to say anything to me. They are. Did, did, what did they say to you when they came, when the IRS came to your, to your business, to you this year? What, what did they tell you? Look, as I said, they didn't say that we did anything wrong. What did they say? I'm, I, look, I'm not, I'm not allowed to discuss it, per their government. Re, re, Peter, respectfully, you, your bank's at the centre of the biggest tax evasion investigation in the world now. These affect- Oh, I, see, you are, I, I seriously doubt that. I seriously doubt that we're at the centre of anything. We're, we're at the periphery at best, and we're not even involved in it. We somehow got caught up in whatever's going on, uh, but, you know, there is there are no valid allegations against the bank. So that's it. If, if it turns so out- if it either, 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 either talk to me about something else, if the sole purpose of this interview was to, was to bait and switch me into an interview about the bank, then let's just end it. Let, let, let me ask a few more questions, and then we can end the interview. Not about the bank. I'm not doing any more bank questions. If it turns out, Peter. I've, or, I've already answered more questions about it than I need to. And I, and I don't appreciate the tone of your questions or the insinuations that you're making about the bank or about me. I understand that's coming through loud and clear. If it turns out that organized criminals, tax evaders, cyber criminals have no, been no, using I'm, your I'm bank, not talk, I don't want to deal in hypotheticals you... anymore. Now you're saying if it turns out. Before you said that you knew that they were, now you're saying if it turns out. Let me rephrase, right? so let me rephrase the question I'm telling then. you let me, let me rephrase to my that, knowledge let that me rephrase it's not the, happening. Let I don't want to the question discuss then. these. All right, look, it is a fact. I'm not asking any more questions on the bank. Okay. It is That's a, it. I'm done. I'll rephrase the question. It's a fact that organized crime, tax evaders, fraudsters are using look, your bank. How is right, that possible look, that, if it, you I'm have just good finishing, banking right? control? There's no more questions. No more questions. No more questions. All right. This is ridiculous. This is, I don't even know what they're trying to do. Peter, it's fair enough to ask these questions given the circumstances. Now, interview's over.